Um, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Um, welcome to the Institute for Government. My name is Peter Riddle. I'm the outgoing di uh, director of the Institute for Government. Um, I'm purely chairing this in my, my capacity, uh, uh, IFG capacity, rather than any other capacity. Um, we've had a, a little bit of reorganisation um, of the panel. Um, I wasn't originally going to be chairing it. Um, for reasons which entirely escaped me, um, our two uh, UK government civil servants um, felt they'd better be nearer their desks at this crucial period, because um, who, who knows who their um, um, Secretaries of State will be by the time this event um, um, ended. Um, we had an event here last night, and I um, had to explain to people once the event had ended that Boris Johnson was Foreign Secretary. <laughs> um, um, now, perhaps because of the timing, we don't know what will, will be, be, come on um, afterwards. Um, just the usual housekeeping stuff. There are stairs there, stairs there, if, if anything happens. Um, we do have an internet outage in the area, so we may be, the Wi-Fi may be um, not quite working. We'll have to see how that develops. So um, if you can't get on, um, it's because of the internet outage in the area. Now, this is the second in a series of events we're doing on the implications of uh, Brexit. The first um, was on the 30th of June, um, when we discussed the implications for Whitehall, um, and we've got another event next week, which I'll refer to uh, uh, at the um, uh, end. And what we're looking at, uh, what are the uh, implications um, for aspects of UK government and governance in that, uh, asp in that respect? Um, we're looking this morning at the implications for the Union, um, and particularly <coughs> at some of the issues of how will devolved governments be involved in negotiating the terms, because of the intermeshing of so much now of the, of the devolved legislation and devolved governments, um, and anything that's happened in London has direct implications um, for Edinburgh, Cardiff, and Belfast. Um, also, the issues of consent for a new deal, which has obviously been raised by many of the politicians and political leaders um, in Scotland, Wales, Northern Ireland. Uh, what happens if there's a disagreement? Um, obviously, the issue of, of another independence referendum in Scotland, the impl uh, implications of the Northern Ireland peace process, devolution in Wales, and of course, there's legislation now going through Parliament uh, on Wales, um, following the legislation for Scotland, um, which went through um, before the elections in May, and also the conundrum of where the devolved nations retain uh, uh, closer integration with the EU than perhaps England will in future and th th that, that position. Now, we've got on the panel, uh, uh, um, a, um, uh, I'll say, two representatives um, from the um, devolved governments. I say the UK government, um, uh, two we were hoping to have here, um, withdrew for the reasons I explained. Um, but we're going to open with my colleague Akash Pound, who is the in-house expert um, on all matters devolved and has been doing a, lo a lot um, on the, particularly on intergovernmental relations, and he's been doing that for some years now, and looking at how the interconnections go between uh, Scotland, Wales, and Northern Ireland and London. And um, he's also, since uh, Brexit happened, been blogging actively on that and looking at that, and a lot of his work on that's been taken up. So um, Akash will speak first. Um, to Akash's right is Ken Thompson, um, who's the Director General for Strategy and External Affairs in the Scottish Government. Um, Ken has, uh, 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 has been here frequently, um, and he has been closely involved on um, constitutional policy for the last decade. Previously, um, he, he, he was the uh, principal private secretary to Donald Dewar at the beginning of the um, um, Scottish Government. Um, he's also a distinguished student in music. Um, uh, he's the only um, um, senior civil servant I know who has a musical score. It's Bach, isn't it? In your office? In, in my office, yes. Yes, he right, has Bach in his office. I um, <laughs> which, um, I was going to point I out, though, Peter, that my permanent secretary is also a music graduate. So we're very musical in Scotland. <laughs> but she didn't, when she came and spoke here, she wasn't ha humming anything, like the, the last Prime Minister. <laughs> and yeah. and our, our, our final speaker is Caris Evans, who handles intergovernmental relations um, for the Welsh Government. Um, she um, was, in her earlier years, um, a Treasury civil servant, um, and um, then um, has spent um, most of her career in Wales, um, dealing with constitutional matters, um, the Richard Commission, and um, in the last few years, as I say, dealing with constitutional affairs. So we've got a, a, the absolutely ideal panel to deal with these matters and to set the context, Akash. OK, 
Okay, thank you, Peter. And yeah, thanks everyone for joining us uh, this bright morning when obviously there's fairly important developments going on elsewhere in um, SW1, so uh, pleased to have you all with us. Um, so yeah, we're here today to discuss the uh, implications of Brexit for the Union. Um, what will be the impact of the vote of 23rd of June on the relations between the four nations and the four uh, governments of the UK? Um, so as we know, the, the result of the referendum saw two nations, uh, England and Wales, vote to leave, while Scotland and Northern Ireland voted to remain in the EU, although it should be emphasised that within each of those four nations there was a significant minority voting the other way. Um, but this has produced a situation where you have four governments, I think, in, uh, each in quite a different position um, in regard to, uh, with regard to this issue. Um, you have a UK government, of course, now uh, committed to implementing Brexit. Brexit means Brexit, um, even if led by a uh, Prime Minister who was on the Remain side. Uh, we have a Welsh government that was on the Remain side of the campaign and uh, I think continues to be concerned about some of the implications of, of, of Brexit, but a majority of Welsh voters, of course, did back leave. So that puts uh, the Welsh government in an interesting position. I'm sure Karis will shed more light on that shortly. Um, in Northern Ireland, the government is uh, divided on the issue as it was during the, uh, the campaign itself. So Arlene Foster, First Minister of Northern Ireland, was the only head of government to, across the UK to campaign for leave and um, the DUP, her party, and, and much of the unionist community there backed that option while uh, the nationalist community concerned about the implications um, for the relationship with the Republic were much more heavily pro-Remain. And Sinn Féin, the junior coalition partner there, has recently said they'll do anything possible to try and veto Brexit. Um, so we'll see how that plays out. So all this, I think, uh, creates a very complex and challenging um, intergovernmental situation um, that yeah, throws up a set of, uh, of questions for how the, the four governments are going to proceed in this, in this difficult uh, time. So first of all, there will certainly be a need to create um, probably new, certainly expanded systems and mechanisms for consultation and engagement um, of the devolved governments in the Brexit negotiation process. Um, David Cameron, um, then still, of course, Prime Minister, um, emphasised that this would be central um, to, the, to the Brexit negotiation process on the morning that the result came out. Um, I have his his, his words here, um, the negotiations will need to involve the full engagement of the, the three devolved governments to ensure that the interests of all parts of our United Kingdom are protected and advanced. Um, but what exactly is that likely to mean? Um, we know from past experience that what the UK government thinks is effective, full involvement of the devolved governments um, in EU and other matters um, is not always the same as, as what people in Edinburgh, Belfast and, and Cardiff would expect. Um, during the renegotiation process, for example, renegotiation of UK terms of... Uh, in terms of membership of the EU last year and earlier this year, um, the three devolved governments all complained, publicly um, stated that they'd been very, uh, pretty much kept out of the negotiation process. Uh, Carwin Jones, First Minister of Wales, I think, said he only found out what the UK's uh, negotiation priorities were when he read about it in the Sunday Telegraph. Um, and there, there were no meetings before the, the key European Council um, of, the, of, the, of the interministerial meeting, the Joint Ministerial Committee on Europe that normally considers these matters. So I think, um, you know, the UK government hasn't always necessarily prioritised these matters. And its view at the time um, was simply that this is a, this is a reserved matter. Uh, membership of the EU is a non-devolved competence. It's for UK government to take forward and then, yes, we may uh, consult with, have conversations with the devolved governments, but very much on, on UK government <coughs> terms. Um, 
And I suppose the question is, is that kind of approach going to be appropriate and sufficient today with the stakes so much higher? Can we just tweak and build upon these existing systems and the, 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 the current culture, I think, for uh, that, 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 that uh, within which intergovernmental relations take place? Or do we need something, something new, something more extensive, perhaps something that rests on different principles um, that treats the devolved governments much more as partners um, and also potentially do we, will there need to be greater transparency and accountability to all the parliaments and assemblies of the UK, not, not just to Westminster? Or will this just again be treated as, no, this is a UK government matter with some consultation around the margins? And my view clearly is that if we don't get this right, um, there is serious potential for for constitutional crisis, for, for serious disputes between the governments, which should be hugely destabilising at a time when the focus will have to be on getting the renegotiations with the rest of the EU uh, proceeding effectively. Um, there's also the possibility that um, at the end of the process, or at some points during the process, assuming legislation comes forward at Westminster to implement Brexit, there will be challenges in the devolved legislatures under the terms of the Legislative Consent Convention, um, <coughs> which recently was, was, was recognised in uh, statute, as, at least as far as Scotland was concerned, and similar is about to happen for Wales. So the Legislative Consent Convention, for, for those unaware, basically says Westminster will not normally legislate in devolved areas without the express consent of the devolved uh, Parliament or Assembly. And Westminster has always, uh, with maybe a couple of, of minor exceptions, abided pretty strictly to that convention. And as I say, it's now put it in statute. So I think it would be a pretty odd time and with possibly serious consequences if it were to ignore it on this issue, and we may end up with sort of cases being brought to the Supreme Court and so on, which surely would not be a healthy way to proceed. So I do think it's very important to get this right, and I'm very interested to hear what Ken and Karis think will be necessary. Um, briefly, I also just wanted to say a little bit about what are likely, even at this early stage, as we can, we can say a little, to be some of the key issues that will need to be negotiated between the governments of the UK as part of this sort of multi-level game with the, also the negotiations ongoing, uh, while the negotiations are ongoing with, with the rest of the EU. So I'm sure people here will, will all be able to point to things within their own domains as well, and Ken and Karis will pick up on things I, I probably have no idea about. But, um, just a couple of points. Well, first of all, I think uh, money is likely to come into this. Um, Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland all receive per capita, I've got the figures here somewhere, um, significantly more money than um, England from common agricultural policy money, structural funds, there's special budgets in Northern Ireland as well, supporting the peace process and North-South cooperation. To what happens to all of that? I think the three finance ministers have said just recently that we shouldn't lose a single penny from this process. So that's going to be on the table. Um, does that then reopen other things about um, devolution finance, fiscal framework agreements that have just been at, you know, after long, tough negotiations themselves um, agreed? Um, immigration and freedom of movement is obviously going to be a key issue. Scotland and Wales both keen to remain fully part of the, of the single market with freedom of movement, keen to guarantee, perhaps you know, more, more expressly than the UK government has thus far done, rights of EU citizens here, already here, and that kind of thing. Um, in, in Northern Ireland, there's the specific issue of the border. Nobody there, I think, wants to see the imposition of border controls um, or break up of the, of the common travel area that predated EU membership. So some complex issues around that. And potentially one of the things that might come up is whether aspects of imp immigration policy uh, should or will need to be devolved uh, to enable the other parts of the UK to, to take a, a different, maybe more pro-immigration policy than, than is the case in England. Um, or indeed this, this idea of, of, of Scotland and maybe the other nations as well having a, a different status, maybe a closer integration within 
a European economic area or, or EU or somehow having a different status than England does uh, within, within the single market. So these kind of options may come onto the table. Then there's also a set of qu interesting questions, I think, about what happens to the powers that will be repatriated from Brussels. So there's things like agriculture, um, in, environmental protection, fisheries and so on, which are currently not reserved to the UK, so thus they're devolved by default, but also highly Europeanised. You take away the European level, do we then suddenly have at least the potential for four completely different systems of agricultural support or environmental regulation to emerge? Or do we need, will, might we need um, federal style systems of uh, coordination across the four governments, across the four nations, the kind of thing we've never really um, had to create actually in, in, in this country under current devolution settlements. Um, and then there's other things like, particularly around I think social and employment rights, where the default will be, those powers will be repatriated to Westminster. But those are areas, of course, where, you know, the case particularly from, from Nicola Sturgeon and, and I, I think also from the Welsh Government was defending social Europe, defending the social rights that are def uh, set out in, in, in European Union directives was why Scotland and Wales wanted to, wanted to remain. Whereas I think for large parts probably of the English Conservative Party, the ability to start um, cutting back some of those social, social, social rights, uh, red tape, is why they wanted to get out of Europe in the first place. So that, for me, creates potential for some quite serious splits. And again, possibly will some of those areas be considered for devolution? So will this, those aspects of the devolution settlement have to be reopened as well? Um, so I think that's enough. <laughs> questions and speculation about the kind of things that will be on the agenda. But I think what we can <laughs> certainly say is um, Brexit is going to change the union almost certainly in quite significant ways. Um, I think the division of powers will certainly have to be reopened, but we might also have to start, have to rethink some of the more fundamental elements of, of the constitutional settlement. Um, you know, Westminster still sort of just about clings to ideas of parliamentary sovereignty and so on. But maybe will we c come out of this with something more like a, a federal settlement eventually with entrenched powers and rights for the devolved governments? Um, clearly making predictions beyond the next five minutes, let alone sort of ten years into the future, is, is, a, is a foolish pursuit at the moment in British politics. But I think these kind of things are worth considering. Um, and although it would be, of course, ironic, I think, if a vote for Brexit, which was all about reasserting Westminster sovereignty, might in the end possibly lead to something quite different emerging. Okay, thank you very much indeed. <coughs> you certainly, um, I slightly um, underline how the world has dramatically changed in the last few months compared with the, the view which was coming from UK ministers that after the Scotland Bill and the Fiscal Settlement and after the Wales Bill, um, everything would be a kind of agreed picture and then we could move on and reassess. I think perhaps um, that, bit, that no longer applies. Hmm. Ken. Thanks, Peter. Uh, just to pick up your point just there, uh, after the Scottish referendum in 2014, uh, my colleagues in the UK government were fond of saying to me that the referendum had settled things. <laughs> and um, the, the bit of wisdom that we distilled out of that was that referendums answer questions, but they don't settle them. Mm -hmm. um, so we've been through, in Scotland, two years of unsettlement since then, and um, the only prediction I would make about what's going to happen after this referendum is that it will not be settled. Mm -hmm. It will not feel like that, and it certainly doesn't. Um, I've got half a dozen points to make, which I'll, I'll try to do quite briefly. Um, I hope they make sense, although um, I was in the city the other day uh, speaking to a friend of mine who's a, uh, a chief executive of a fund management firm, and we were comparing experiences since the referendum. And I said, we've been living from day to day, thinking that sounded quite dramatic, and she laughed at me and said, I'm living from hour to hour. <laughs> uh, um, so uh, th this has ripples all over the place. So uh, six points, each of which I'm, I'm going to try to illustrate with a quotation. And the first one is from a very senior UK government civil servant who said a few days after the referendum, quote, the union is back in the melting pot. 
And I think that is a good frame for Brexit and the Union. It, it, uh, it brings back into play some issues which haven't really gone away in Scotland, but which are now very present, I think, for my counterparts in the UK <coughs> government. And um, reasons for that are the, uh, the nature of the result in Scotland, uh, the, the, f the description by the First Minister in Scotland that um, for Scotland to be taken out of the European Union, having voted to remain, would be, in quotes, democratically unacceptable. Um, and there's something here about mandates and about um, how those are reflected in the, the world that we're now in. Um, I like the way that um, Peter and Akash framed this by saying that, we, in effect, we have had four results, not one result. And I think the only way I can make sense of the intergovernmental relations and the uh, politics of this is to think of this as four results. Two countries in the Union voted to leave and two voted to remain. And what, what the governmental, intergovernmental system is now grappling with is the consequences of that. Um, I think that that will be a process of negotiation between governments uh, and that, that will, uh, the, the position of the Scottish Government on that will, I think will be, uh, we're, we're fond of using the phrase, parity of esteem. And I said to Philip Rycroft the other day, who was to have been one of the panellists today, that uh, we now knew that parity of esteem meant that we had each lost a referendum. <laughs> uh, and we, <laughs> uh, and the, the serious version of that point is that um, just as in the run-up to the last referendum, we did some inter good intergovernmental work to produce the Edinburgh Agreement and to find a way of reaching agreement between governments rather than one government consulting another and then doing what it was going to do in the first place. Uh, I think we are back in that position now, and I'm not quite sure what shape the, the, uh, will emerge from that, but that seems to me to be the, the nature of the process. Uh, point three is, is the, uh, to share with you the very first words that the First Minister said to me at 6.30 on the Friday morning after the referendum. Uh, and I made this point to a group of my senior U UK colleagues because um, having told me that they thought the union was back in the melting pot, um, my impression of their impression of the First Minister was that she was in a rush to a referendum. And I wanted to give them a different perspective on that. The first thing she said to me that at 6.30 that morning was not, here's the date for the referendum. It was uh, with a look of genuine concern and some shock. It was, what have they done? And her first reaction to this is to think about the damage that this might do to Scotland, to Scotland's interests, to um, its relationships uh, with the European Union, within the UK. Um, and it, it, in all of her public statements since then, it, th that thread has run through this and she's been made very clear that while she does regard a, a second independence referendum as an option that needs to be on the table, she's also been very clear that it's not her starting point. And I think it's important to understand that to see how this will play out. Um, point four is um, a quote from this morning's Telegraph. Um, it's always good to be told what to do by the Telegraph. Um, it's advice to the Prime Minister, the new Prime Minister, uh, she, it, it says she will have to turbocharge her Brexit department. She needs to move hundreds of civil servants into it and order the mandarins to make this their priority. <laughs> if you think that machinery of government is the answer to this question, then you're probably not understanding the question, I think. Um, and a, a personal reflection on that is, um, the, is, is the problem of churn. Um, since the referendum, I have sat in rooms with uh, my new colleagues from the uh, Cabinet Office Europe unit, and the phrase that uh, I take away from that is, I've only been doing this since Monday, but it seems to me that. <laughs> <laughs> and, and what we're trying to do in Scotland is, is to, um, to, to bring back together, um, to, you know, not to create new machinery, but to bring back together the people who have dealt with these kinds of issues over the last, well, um, since 2007 and probably before that, if you go back to it, the original devolution settlement. So how the civil service as a whole brings to bear the uh, knowledge and expertise that it has is a bit of a challenge in this uh, new set of circumstances. Uh, point five is, I, I don't really have a quote, but perhaps if I did, it would be here we go again. Um, the, and it picks up Akash's point about the, the, the emergence of some kind of quasi-federal system. It seems to me that what we have done over the last decade or more is um, done sort of ad hoc federalism by addressing issues as they arise. We addressed the desire for self-government in Scotland through devolution in the first place. Uh, we addressed the, um, the question of whether Parliament or the people are sovereign through the Edinburgh Agreement. We've addressed the question of funding and whether the Barnett formula still works in, for a tax raising government through the fiscal framework. And we do each of these as a one-off negotiation and we don't really uh, produce a structure uh, that, that people would recognise as a federal structure. Maybe that can't <coughs> be done, but, but here we go again. We're about to get into another negotiation in which we try to make sense of what the referendum means for the quasi-federal structure of the UK. 
And final quote uh, is from an article by the Irish columnist Fintan O'Toole <coughs> a few days before the referendum. And the headline of his article was, with a nice sense of irony in his tongue slightly in his cheek, is England ready for self-government? Um, and he, the, the thoughtful point he was making in the article was that one of the consequences of a leave vote might be that his, his words were that England might stumble towards independence. Um, and it, it's a, a, a theme of a lot of IFG work in the past, uh, which is the, the only country in this union that doesn't have a, a government, a parliament of, and a government of its own is England. And I think the, what we're about to see is going to uh, throw that question even more sharply into relief. If you live and work in Scotland, it's felt in quite sharp relief for some time, but I think it, it uh, has been present in the referendum campaign and will be present in the aftermath. Okay, thank you very much indeed. Lots and lots of questions we'll come back to, uh, which you've raised uh, um, in your remarks. Caris. Thank you, Peter, um, and thanks for the introduction. I, I have to say that as the sort of Welsh person on the panel, it's, it's always, people are always surprised. I don't have any music credentials. I'm, I, I'm not a member of a choir. So, um, yes, just to uh, start by saying that it's really welcome that the Institute for Government is putting the spotlight on this domestic aspect of the EU negotiations. And I think uh, Akash has outlined very well the, the, the range of issues that, 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 that come into this. But in a way, this is also a continuity of the sort of issues that you've been working on uh, since the Scottish referendum. And you know, the, very much the emphasis on uh, don't take the union for, for granted, um, you know, the importance of the, of the civil service and you know, the joint shared civil service values and intergovernmental relations as, as part of the, of the glue or indeed the cement that we need to, to keep the union together because our, our First Minister, Carwyn Jones, you know, his immediate response to the Scottish referendum was that it had underlined so strongly that the United Kingdom is a voluntary union of nations and all this you know, discussion about machinery and so on, as Ken has said, is just about the process for making, making that a, a reality. Um, so coming from Wales, I, I have to start with finance uh, here and um, there's a huge amount at stake for Wales in, in these negotiations. I mean, Wales currently receives around 600 million a year of investment from European programmes. That's the combination of uh, agricultural support programmes, um, the really important uh, economic and social projects in Wales funded through the structural funds, and also uh, you know, considerable investment that goes into our universities and, and, and other, other projects. So, so th this is really uh, a substantial for us, and d during the campaign, uh, you know, commitments were made that every penny of this would, would keep coming to Wales and, you know, the, the First Minister has said that it's absolutely vital that that, that, that continues um, and this, that issue will be the subject of huge scrutiny in Wales <laughs> as, 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 this process as this process develops. So just, to, I mean, to focus really on, on two dimensions of this, as I said, the, the, the funding aspect and the, the constitutional aspect. Um, the point about the European funding is not only you know, its intrinsic value to Wales, but also it's part of a, a wider context where it's been very well established objectively that Wales is, is relatively underfunded in relation to its needs. Barnet has shortchanged Wales, even if you, if, we're, if you assume we're getting all this European funding, if that were not to be protected, you know, the situation is much worse. And, and that's the, you know, the, the really vital context for these negotiations from, from our perspective. Um, the, on, the, on the constitutional side, um, I mean, there are you know, a number of positives for, for Wales. I mean, it was very welcome that the Prime Minister made such a point of emphasising the intergovernmental aspects of the negotiations, um, you know, immediately on, in, in Downing Street after the referendum and then reinforced again in, in the Cabinet statement. So that's really positive and, you know, that was followed up immediately at official level by some, you know, in, really um, very serious discussions that are continuing about how that is going to work in terms of the, in terms of the machinery. So that's, that's really positive. Um, I think on, on a sort of note of caution for those of us who've been sort of at the coal face of, of trying to make the 
uh, intergovernmental relations process work. Um, you know, we don't underestimate how, how difficult that, that has been in the past. Um, you know, simply because, and, and you know, this isn't for want of trying. I mean, there's been a huge effort, but intensified, I think, since the Scottish referendum by, by the Cabinet Office to really ramp up the engagement of Whitehall with, with devolution and to strengthen <coughs> both the sort of cultural learning and development side of it and the, the process side of it. So, so that is very positive, but, we, but we're still left with a process which is run by the Cabinet Office, which is used to running Cabinet Committee meetings where, you know, UK government is in charge and it's driving forward its own business. So, you know, running into governmental relations like that, you know, doesn't, you know, that's not how it needs to work. And, and you know, it is getting better, but it is still a big challenge uh, for us. And I think what the EU withdrawal process is going to do is to really ramp that up. Um, it's going to need to intensify that process and that is going to be a, a big shared challenge for, for the civil service. Um, on the positive side of that, I think, and I'm always somebody who uh, you know, instinctively looks on the bright side of everything, um, I remember from in a previous role, I was working on public service reform at, at local level and you know the challenge of how do you get public uh, service delivery agencies, local authorities, the NHS, the police, etc, to really collaborate uh, in, in, in the more you know in the, in the way that Akash was describing, not just kind of consult people at the last minute, tell them what you were going to do and maybe tweak it, but but genuinely work together. And there's a lot of research on, on this. Um, but you know, one of the key things that, that we learned from that is one of the things that really improves relationships and strengthens collaboration is when people work together on a joint project. So I think you know, drawing that uh, analogy into this situation, it, this is going to be an intensification of intergovernmental working. Uh, there is a real indication that the UK government is serious about making that work. So, you know, if that happens, I think it could actually really strengthen intergovernmental relations because we are, in a sense, working together in spite of the, the political differences in, in some respects, working together to get the best deal for the United Kingdom out of this process. And of course, from our perspective, to get the best deal for Wales in that. So I think there are reasons to be optimistic as well as um, realistic about, about how difficult this process is going to be. Um, and finally, um, Ken mentioned the, the federal uh, debate, uh, which again isn't new. I mean, it, was, it, 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 brought, it came to the fore after the Scottish referendum. And you know, this is something that Carolyn Jones has made many speeches about, including a very well received one in this room, Peter, I think. Um, and he, you know, he has been consistently arguing that since devolution, the, the, the issue of you know, different mandates in each part of the UK, different uh, direct accountabilities, and of course the formal um, entrenchment of the devolved legislatures in the UK's constitution, which has come about as a result of the Scotland Bill and the Wales, Wales Bill currently uh, before Parliament. You know, this has really uh, jacked up and um, brought the federal issue to the fore. And I think the point we would like to make from Wales, I think, here, is that the argument about a more federal structure for the UK you know, has always been bedeviled by the imbalance and, you know, the question of England and how will that be resolved. And of course, that's not a matter for us. I mean, that's, that's a huge question for, 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 for England to, to debate, but of course it affects the rest of the UK. But I think what we would like to see is more thinking about how we can make progress on that without having a fully federal structure, which is so challenging but by bringing into this more federal thinking. Um, and our, uh, the speech that Karen Jones made last year, I think is still very relevant. He quoted Andreas Goss, the Swiss uh, philosopher, who talked about federalism as a process of enabling union while guaranteeing diversity. And in a sense, that is the big, the big challenge as we develop into, into government relations, not just in this negotiation, but for the long term.
Thanks, Karis, very much indeed. And <coughs> very interesting insights from both of you on these issues. Before opening it up, can I, I just explore two areas? One is um, uh, a, a, essentially a constitutional one, which is legislative consent. How does that fit into the picture? I mean, you, you know, it's, it's been <coughs> strengthened in the, now the Scotland Act, it's going through in the Wales Bill. Um, how will that affect it, Ken? Uh, it's an interesting uh, question, and it's been quite topical in Scotland. Uh, I, I listened to my First Minister yesterday explaining it to the world's press, so I'll see if I can recreate oh. her answer. <laughs> um, the legislative consent process, I'm sure most people in this room will be very familiar with it. So um, if a bill came before, uh, or a proposal came before the Scottish Parliament uh, involving taking Scotland out of the European Union, uh, would the Scottish Parliament give its consent to that? Well, on the current composition of that Parliament, no. Uh, what, what would, does that amount to a veto? No, I don't think it does, and I don't think that the First Minister thinks that. Um, it, it's simply a, a statement of the obvious. Um, whether such a bill would come before the, the um, Scottish Parliament and how the Convention operates in these circumstances and what the legislative consequences or route towards uh, exit would be are other big questions. But I want to go somewhere else, which is to say that actually I don't think that the detail of legislative consent is the key thing here. The key thing is how did people in Scotland vote uh, about their relationship with the European Union? And how will we then give effect to that uh, or accommodate that within the process that is now underway? And that will be about intergovernmental relations rather than about legislative consent. Right, yeah, exactly. I just want to clarify. Karis, do you want to add on that? <coughs> well, no, not, not to talk about the uh, legislative consent mm. motion itself per se, but I think more about the negotiation process. I think, you know, whether the issue of legislative consent um, you know, comes into play and becomes very controversial will depend a great deal on the outcome of the negotiations and the extent to which people in Wales feel and, and you know, the uh, First Minister feels that Wales' interests genuinely have been protected in the process. So, so in a sense, that comes back to how effective uh, the process of, of, of involving us in the negotiations will have been. So, so, so I think that will be a key issue for us. <coughs> okay, do you want to go in? Um, yeah, only to, just, just to add, I, I think, yeah, uh, th we could talk about the, the, the process and so on, but I do think it comes back to this question of, um, of, of constitutional principle. And, and, and there is something, I think, of a, of a tension between, you know, classical conceptions mm. of parliamentary sovereignty, this is a UK-wide decision for the people of the UK as a whole, they voted Brexit. That is one conception that you, I think you will hear some people express. Um, on the other hand, yeah, I mean, it's been particularly strongly expressed in Scotland because of the, because of the result there, which obviously differed to Wales. 62% of the people voted, mm. voted to remain. The vast majority of members of the Scottish Parliament um, favour staying in the European Union. So there, there's a, there's a very different concept of, of how our constitution now in practice works or should work, whether the, the, the sovereignty of the Scottish nation um, is, is, is seen as, as, as something that needs to be defended in, in its own right. Yeah. Can I just explore another issue which was raised, which is the policy one, that there's been a uniformity of EU policy in certain areas, very important areas for Scotland and Wales, and also Northern Ireland too, and very important ones there. Uh, some of it's to do with money, as you said, Karis, and that's a very uh, clearly massively important issue. But the extent to which, as the question Akash raised, you may get, this goes back to the Four Nations point, that, that uh, you now uh, will say, OK, we've had an EU policy on agriculture, fisheries and so on. We in Scotland on, on fisheries, um, in, in Wales on regional sport, want to develop our own distinctive policies and how that will play out. Ken? Uh, there's a prior question, which is whether Scotland will in fact have the same relationship with the European Union as, as uh, an, an exiting England. Yeah. Um, our minister's position is that uh, they want to preserve, protect that relationship, and that implies um, maintaining the acquis, which implies maintaining, um, in this case, the common agriculture policy, the common fisheries policy. Um, of course, we don't know what the outcome will be, and uh, one of the major exercises that's now underway, led by the Cabinet Office, is mapping the the various areas in which um, policy is currently driven uh, to quite a large extent by 
the European Union and thinking through the consequences of that no longer being the case in some or other parts of the UK. And there's a huge amount of detail in that, and it doesn't take long for the civil service to burrow down into the detail and somebody starts talking about phytosanitary regulation, which has happened. Um, so I, but I think we're, we're still quite a long way from the detail of all that. Karen? Yes, I think we'll need to add to that that if um, the things that are repatriated, as you say, are then exercised in four different parts mm. of the UK, um, if they're things that affect each other, which they probably will, um, you know, again, there will need to be intergovernmental relations machinery for negotiating that, you know, that interface. I suppose if you, if you think about the um, current devolution settlement, I mean, a lot of the big things that are devolved, you know, the, um, the NHS, education, local government, I mean, they're things where each administration can largely, you know, develop its own very distinctive policies. I mean, Wales has a very... <coughs> Wales and Scotland have, uh, and Northern Ireland each have, you know, very distinct approaches to, uh, in Wales's case, a social partnership relationship with the workforce and a collaborative approach to public service delivery, not a competition approach. So, you know, and we've been able to do that because it, it doesn't really affect anybody else. Whereas if you're looking at issues like state aid, um, you know, agricultural policy and so on, those, those will have much more... Uh, impacts on each other, so well, there will need to be more strengthened, uh, more effective intergovernmental relations to, to deal with that. So it, again, it comes back to the point about the intensification and importance of, of those issues. And it's not, it's, it's not a coincidence either. I mean, there's a reason I would argue that those are the things that have been Europeanised because they're the things that naturally operate across borders and where currently, you know, intergovernmental coordination across 28 countries has been the way Indeed. that it's been resolved. Yes, but again, to make the, 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 the other connected point, that when devolution happened, you know, th th we were in this sort of three-tier <laughs> structure, the sort of supra-government things that were handled at European level, the UK level, and the devolved level. Well, we're now, you know, all of that is, is being reopened, and that's why Carwin Jones has said that this calls for a fundamental look at the, at the way the union operates. Right, let, let's, we've got a relatively limited amount of time, so I want to open it up um, to questions. Um, if you could say who you are, where you come from. Um, um, uh, hold, hold, hold on, <laughs> the, the mic's coming, Emily. I'm, I'm Emily Thornbury, I'm the um, Shadow Secretary of State in the Foreign Office, um, and have been for a week. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think it's ten days now, actually. <laughs> um, I think it's... Uh, can I start by congratulating the Institute for Government for holding this session? I think that it is very timely and extremely interesting. It's unfortunate that we've not been able to hear a Northern Irish voice, because I think that actually an entire session on Northern Ireland perhaps is, is very much called for. Um, the points I wanted to make briefly were... This illustrates completely, doesn't it, the idea of how mad it is to have a, a referendum when there is no plan B in case the public decide not to go the way the government wants the public to go. And so for us, to, and the Brexiteers clearly had no plan B at all. Um, in fact, had a lot of different contradictory ones. And so the difficulty is that although the public have, have said, across the whole of the UK have said, in a majority, that we should, we should leave the EU. They haven't been clear about what our continuing relationship with the EU is. And obviously, the, this seminar is about the different nuances in terms of a continuing relationship. I thought it was very interesting, Ken, how you said how you were not emphasising the idea of Scotland leaving the UK and reapplying to join the, e the EU, because, of course, presumably it would mean that you would need to join the Euro as well, which is another aspect. And I think another thing, although that we were talking about today is in terms of the other nations, I think that we should also think about London because there's more people I speak as a London MP we have more Londoners than there are Scots we more of us Londoners voted to stay in the EU it will affect our economy hugely and we are ignored so if we're talking about you know having different relationships depending on the the views of the public a we have to ask what are the views of the public that have been expressed <laughs> because that's very far from clear because there was no referendum on what our continuing relationship with the EU should be and b you know places like London should not be should not be ignored and we need to be part of that negotiations too 
Um, I did think that uh, the Brexiteers had a great deal to answer for, um, not having any clear plans, and I, it was as if they had established themselves as a sort of pop-up party, um, and uh, with no, you know, no accountability at all, and they popped up and they got us into this dark place and they all popped off again. However, for the last 11 hours, it seems I'm now shadowing Boris Johnson, who's one of the Brexiteers, so we should see what he says about things. <laughs> thanks, very, thanks very much. I'm not sure whether he's one of your constituents or he Jeremy's. He's one, of, he's one of your constituents. Um, David. And then we'll answer the, the two points. Uh, David Walker, Guardian Public. Um, I have to ask both Caris and Ken the existential question, which is, can you really remain part of a unified UK civil service as this process pans out? By analogy, if we are moving towards federalism, federal... Uh, levels of administration exist separately from the identity of officials in, for example, Canada and Germany. Lender officials, provincial officials are different from federal officials. Is your destiny necessarily to decouple from the UK civil service? Right. The two, the, 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 there are two lots of very big questions Emily and, and David have raised. Ken. Um, so, Emily, I think um, we, we could have a whole seminar on um, the, the Scotland's route to independence and what you would do with all of that. And I, as I said, that's not where our, uh, um, our energies are focused at the moment. But we did a lot of work on that um, in, the, in the run up to the 2014 uh, <coughs> referendum. And the point I would make in response to yours is that we did have a plan in 2014 for what would happen on either scenario. Um, and we did actually have a bit of a plan for this scenario, I'm glad to say. Have, so I wish we had a, a bit more of a plan, but we did have a plan. Um, um, on the, uh, the existential point, it's, it's nice, David, to be, uh, to, for people to think that the civil service is an existential question. It's usually the union that's the existential question. But um, uh, my answer to that uh, up to this point, and I think still, is that uh, what we are doing is providing support and advice to the duly elected government of the day. And the difference post-evolution is that we do that in parallel, not in series. Uh, so it's not that different, I think, from the change that you get going from a, a majority administration in London from, of one party to another. It's just that we're providing that support uh, to different parties um, at the same time. And in the course of my career, uh, which is a bit longer than I care to remember now, uh, I've worked for ministers of four different political parties in three forms of government answerable to two parties while part of one civil service. So it can be done, and I, I don't think that this will break it, but it, it will certainly evolve it in some future direction, which I can't quite see yet. Um, well, as, as Ken said, it will evolve and these are very big challenges, but it isn't the, the Welsh Government's position that they want a separate civil service and as civil servants I think we, we find that there are real advantages in being part of the same uh, it's not the same organisation. I mean, it's very clear if you're a Welsh civil servant that you're working to the Welsh government and Welsh ministers, and you know, there's no, there's no kind of that isn't ever in question. Um, but what you are trying to do is to work together with with the UK government in in a way that's efficient and and you know delivers for Wales. Um, a lot of the things that we work on um, in, in the Welsh Government are necessarily collaborations with, with the UK Government. I mean, you know, big things like the uh, Cardiff City deal, um, really big projects like that. And, you know, there are a lot more UK Government civil servants in Wales than there are a relatively small number of us working for the, for the Welsh Government. So I think it's a very practical argument, really, that, that, it, that it works. Um, we, we do have a lot in common. As Peter said, I used to work in the Treasury, and it's been invaluable, you know, being, uh, having that experience of being in the Treasury when we used to develop great new initiatives and then think, oh, God, we've forgotten about the, we used to call them the territorials in, in those yeah. days. So, so I think, it, you know, it really does help to understand the other side and the problems they have and the pressures they're under. And equally, I think Whitehall understands that, you know, the pressures and the expectations that, that are on us in, in Wales. So I think it generally does facilitate getting, the, you know, the work of, of government done. Uh, and, and, you know, that's a very practical, practical argument. Just to say, on, on the Northern Ireland point, we were, of course, hoping to have some Northern Ireland government. There are some people here with Northern Ireland, um, I think, hats uh, on. I don't know if they want to come in at all. Um, I, I can understand, perhaps, not, not at this stage. Right, gentlemen, now. George Hosking. I'm chief executive of a charity, but I'm here in a personal capacity. Um, as a Scot, I'm very interested to know what happens if the 
negotiations to get a special role for Scotland inside the United Kingdom, but still inside the EU, fail. Uh, Nicola Sturgeon decides she wants a referendum. Theresa May says, no, you can't have a referendum. Nicola Sturgeon has one anyway, and Scotland votes to leave. What, in constitutional terms, happens next? Typical question. Akash is going to answer it. Yeah, Akash answers hypothetical questions. That's why he's employed. I'm not sure we quite answered um, Emily Thornberry's questions. Mm -hmm. The well, yeah, and, and and your question about contingency plans. So just briefly on that. I mean, I think on the sort of should have the, there have been a plan for the result. Um, there's a political level thing about you know the Leave campaign. What what plans they should have made. Um, as far as the civil service was concerned, I mean, I think we know that, you know, they were, the instruction from ministers was not to do, de at least here in Whitehall, uh, not to do detailed contingency planning. So I think, do think that was a, that was a, you know, a ministerial level decision. Um, but I, it does actually, um, it does actually flag quite an interesting issue about referendums as you know something we don't have a huge amount of experience of in this country I mean before elections of course there's very well established conventions that civil ser the civil service prepares for the different possible outcomes you know has access talks with the opposition and and has some kind of a, a plan for, for the different possible results um, referendums yeah we don't have enough experience to have those kind of conventions and the view is simply there is a government view of you know in this case remain in the Scottish uh, <coughs> independence referendum obviously the UK government had a clear view and didn't do contingency planning for a yes vote so if any government is uh, bold enough to hold another referendum <laughs> in future I think these kind of questions probably should be debated a bit beforehand um, London I mean London's obviously miles behind Scotland Wales Northern Ireland in general in terms of its devolution and, and sort of constitutional status and I, and I do think it's likely that um, yes with the result we've had and a you know strong new leader um, of London London may well start to assert itself more in the in the territorial politics of the UK I mean it's very hard to to predict how that will play out um, but yeah I mean it hasn't been mentioned in the same breath when when, when the government's been talking about consulting with the devolved governments. I don't think anyone's mentioned London, but yeah, at some point London may, may well sort of start to reach that status. Um, on Scotland, if we, have, if we end up with that kind of constitutional crisis, well, of course, we've, ne we've never quite been there before. I mean, the 2014 referendum, there was a negotiated agreement that, that, that uh, between the two governments, Ken referred to it earlier, Ken was essentially involved in doing the deal, um, that gave temporary legal competence to the Scottish Parliament to hold the referendum. So that, that power has now expired. Implicitly, um, if the Scottish Parliament were to hold a referendum um, it, without such an agreement, that could be subject to uh, challenge um, by the UK government. That could could lead to, to, to a case going to the Supreme Court um, on whether, well, the legislation in the first place was um, within competence or, or ultra vires, um, and whether the Scottish Government could use public funds to hold a referendum. Did that arise over Ca Catalonia? Because of the direct well, parallel. Yeah, I mean, that was why do you say something? Oh, uh, well, I, I mean, I don't know. I, I don't know all the ins and outs of that. But yeah, I mean, Cat the, the approach taken by the Spanish Government to Catalan uh, drive for, 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 for independence and their, um, the referendums or Ooh. something like referendums that they have held. I mean, that stands in marked contrast to the um, negotiated, uh, the deal done between the UK and Scottish governments mm -hmm. in 2014. And, and we see just ongoing sort of constitutional deadlock between Madrid and Barcelona. Mm -hmm. Um, I do think anyone who's observed the two would say that, you know, we, one would hope we don't end up in a si similar situation here, but, you know, we don't know yet exactly what, what position the new Prime Minister here will take and, and, and whether the government here will, will say it was a once in a generation yeah. thing, that's how it was described at the time, we'll have to wait and see. 
Nod, nod, nodding hy uh, hypothetically, <laughs> Kate. Why is um, nodding? From um, yeah. Um, <laughs> we got no number number of questions. You two, and then Robert, and then we'll come 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 across. We'll, we'll group them together. If you can keep them fairly brief, because we limit <coughs> limited time on sure. it. Uh, Gemma Tetlow from the Financial Times. Um, both Akash and Ken sort of referred to this idea that maybe the, one, the devolved nations would retain a closer relationship with Europe, and you're even hinting staying in the single market if England came out of it. How in practical terms would that actually work, though, without just basically throwing up a whole load of new borders and barriers between England and Scotland and Northern Ireland? Okay. Yeah, simple one, Gemma. Yeah, uh, <laughs> uh, Alistair Smith, Competition and Markets Authority. And my question is really a different version of the same question. In those areas of policy where you, that you mentioned, which are currently very heavily Europeanised, which would return to the UK and could then be devolved, competition policy and regulatory policy are at the heart of the single market. Could you, inv and the businesses that are subject to them operate on a deeply integrated UK-wide basis at the moment. Could you envisage a situation where UK businesses, retail businesses, the telecoms companies faced three or four different regulatory and competition regimes in their UK market. Right, that's a very interesting one. And if you pass it back to, to Rob there, yeah. Robert Hill, um, forgive me, not a question. I wanted to add a bit more, if I might, to Akash's uh, hypothetical answer. Well, answer to the hypothetical question, um, which is this, that I think if Scotland found that the result of the negotiations were so unsatisfactory that the Scottish government formally decided, right, uh, our least worst option now uh, is to revisit independence, and we're going to ask the people of Scotland again uh, whether now, in these changed circumstances, they want independence. My own view is that they could craft a referendum question which would be within the competence of the Scottish Parliament. So it needn't be the same as the 2014 question, I think it could be along the lines of, do you, the people of Scotland, authorise the Scottish Government to enter into negotiations with the British Government with a view to attaining independence? And if the people of Scotland voted yes, I, I, my own view is that the Supreme Court would uh, rule, if challenged, that that was within the competence of the Scottish Parliament, because it's not seeking independence as such. Um, and if Scotland voted yes, there would then be a very, very strong democratic mandate for the Scottish Government to say to the UK Government, this is what the people of Scotland have formally said they want, you must now enter bona fide into negotiations. Well. Just on Catalonia, it is slightly different because the Spanish Constitution says that Spain is an indivisible republic, um, and that is why the Spanish Constitutional Court has ruled that an independence referendum is unconstitutional. I was thinking more of politics, but the, the two, two separate areas there, single market competition uh, uh, and um, it would be possible to frame a question. Okay. So on, the, on the question of um, what options are there for, um, for what we might call a, a, a differential outcome here, um, just as we're all now experts in, our, or at least we're aware of Article 50 of the Lisbon Treaty, we're also all now aware of the phrase reverse Greenland, which is one of the options. Um, there are other um, uh, ways that you can look at this. So there's obviously there's the Norway model, there's the um, models thrown up by other parts or, or, or other territories which are much smaller than Scotland, but such as the Crown Dependencies. Um, I, I, I think that there is a lot of work to be done on options and, and models and so on. My starting point for it is not actually to look at Greenland or Norway or whatever, but to say uh, what is it in the relationship with the European Union that Scotland wants to protect? What are the dimensions of that? Um, and that they're implicit in the, in the arguments for Remain. Um, access to uh, single markets, the free movement of, of people, the protection of rights and so on, regulation, protection of the environment. So it, when you list the, the interests that you have in that relationship and then you look at the possible models or options, uh, th I think that helps you to see where you can develop something either from an existing precedent or something new, um, because that's the kind of territory that we're in. Uh, in order to help us do that, uh, the First Minister has appointed a standing council on Europe uh, with people on it who have great expertise in those areas because Scotland has not yet, uh, not yet had enough of experts. Uh, so the, that group is, is having its, its first meeting today, in fact, and um, I'm flying back up to Edinburgh to have dinner with them. 
and I'm sure that uh, out of their discussions and, uh, and deliberations we will uh, get more uh, understanding of what the possible options will be. And on the point about regulation, um, just to make it very briefly, I, I think uh, in, in the run-up to the independence referendum we were very alive to the issue of uh, what would have been cross-border regulation in the event of independence uh, and the implications <coughs> of that. Uh, the, the, there will be lots of different perspectives on this. I think uh, you have to find a way of making that work. And I think that uh, one of the things that has not yet happened in the debate on post-Brexit is, is voices of that sort, the interests of business uh, and, and the consequences for business. Uh, seen from Edinburgh, the debate here has been turned in a bit on the politics of leadership elections and so on, rather than thinking through the, the consequences, the, the, the ripples from the stone that's been thrown into the pond. And I think business regulation will be one of those. And Robert's made a helpful suggestion for you. And, and thank you, Robert. I'm, I noted that with great interest. Just on the, the, the regulation question. I mean, in, in Wales, we are always arguing for, for you know, more subsidiarity, for a presumption of devolution, um, unless there's a good reason for things to be run at the centre. So we, we, we've done uh, a lot of thinking about, well, and this is in the context of the Wales Bill, about you know, what is the union for? What are the things that really should stay at, at a UK level? And, and one of the biggest parts of that is the UK's internal market and, and the importance of that for business. And uh, you know, we've, so one of the reasons that we don't want these things devolved you know, in, in, in the Wales Bill uh, is because of the importance of maintaining that internal market and, and seeing you know, regu regulation and business regulation as part of that. Thank you. Uh, okay. oh, thanks, yeah. No, just briefly, I mean, on, on um, possible models uh, for sort of differential membership of the EU or integration of the single market. I mean, yeah, Ken sort of um, referred to the, the, the reverse Greenland, which sounds like a sort of painful yoga position. But <laughs> <laughs> um, there are, I think, 20 something uh, territories recognised under European law that have, uh, that are mostly kind of little islands like the yeah, UK Crown dependencies or bits of, you know, leftover bits of French and. Dutch empires scattered around the place that have some kind of halfway house relationship one way or the other. So I don't think there's anything um, that would be a, you know, a direct uh, a model that you could just lift up and apply to, to any of the nations of the UK. None, none, of, the, none of the current deals um, would be for a country of the size of, of Scotland and none of them have land borders with um, well, most of them are islands, so they don't have land borders with anyone, <laughs> but with, 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 with their parent country, so to speak. So, yeah, it would have to be, it would have to be something new, but there's some kind of precedent of, of different parts of um, European states having differential relationships. Shouldn't forget Gibraltar as well, which already has a sort of, I can't remember the exact details, but half in, half out thing. Um, on competition policy, I mean, that's probably going to be a big thing that I one will need to learn more about. I, I, I certainly don't enough, know enough to, to, to comment. I mean, the only thing I'd say on that is, Karis referred earlier to, you know, the, 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 the nature of the devolution settlements we've had to date has been things are devolved or they're reserved. This is simplifying, of course, but, you know, public service delivery, to a large extent, you're able to devolve and not worry too much about cross-border effects, though there are some. Now we might be moving into an era where, yeah, we have to think about... Um, if those things like that and cross-border things like uh, environmental regulation are devolved, at least in part, we may need to, need to start building much more extensive um, systems for, for joint government working, so along the lines of, 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 of proper federal systems to go back to that point again. Right, got, um, just let's go for some final questions. Bob Morris, Constitution Unit, late, very late Home Office. I'd like to ask the immigration question. Um, we have not controlled land frontiers in modern times within the United Kingdom. There was a permit system between, between the island of Ireland and the rest of uh, the United Kingdom, Great Britain, uh, during the Second World War and up till 1952. Um, how salient do members of the panel think the immigration frontier control question will be both in internal uh, intergovernmental negotiations within the UK 
and uh, in the larger Brexit negotiation between the UK and the, uh, the rest of the Union, you know, what is the relationship between these? How salient will immigration control be as an issue? How far will it be a driver in some of the conclusions that are reached? Jill? Then, then, I was just going to ask a, a sort of rather dull practical question. Uh, it's Jill Russell from the Institute for Government. Uh, when Bernard Jenkin was talking here last week about the implications of Whitehall, he had a vision where we could exit Im instantly, and we would just simply take one sort of clause which mapped all of existing European regulation into UK law, uh, and then at your leisure you could decide whether to uh, amend it or not. And he suddenly became a massive fan of European environmental regulation and said, of course, we want to have clean bathing water and stuff like that. So it's quite an interesting, interesting new perspective of all this regulation. Of course, we wouldn't want to destroy that regulatory framework. But I just wonder, from a devolved country perspective, would just simply mapping the European acquis into UK law be the right way to go? Or would you expect at that point of exit for there to be a, a segregation between what was going into UK law and what was going into your laws, and I didn't know what thinking you were doing about the legislative implications of Brexit, assuming you haven't done a separate deal or gone somewhere, Ken, but as a thought <laughs> experiment, you're still part of the union. Right, and there's one final question there, gentlemen. There. Hi, uh, Matt Wood from uh, Personal Capacity. Uh, this whole mess has been a complete failure of our constitutional systems. Uh, we have an unrepresentative voting system leading to minority governments with a majority of seats, we have uh, incomplete devolution, we have no written constitution, and we have uh, a weak electoral commission. How do we fix this mess? <laughs> <laughs> I think, I think you're, you're not going to get a full answer to that one, I'm afraid. Um, uh, right. Uh, uh, and, and also, any final reflections? Karis, let's start, start with you. You've got a wide range of issues you can take up there. I'm not going to pretend that I've got answers to them. Uh, yes, the immigration issue is going to be very salient in the negotiations, but I, I, I haven't got a particularly Welsh angle to, to offer on that. Um, it, it, it's early days. Um, the point Jill makes is, 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 is crucial. Um, huge amount of work for the, uh, for the devolved legislatures in dealing with the, the legislative fallout of all of this. I don't, I don't know the answer to quite how that can be done. I think we're, we're still working it all through at, at the moment. But um, yeah, the, the, you know, the inherited body of legislation is, is enormous. But I think just as an aside in terms of what Jill has said, you know, what's interesting is that having for years had a debate or that's been very much coloured by all this horrendous, you know, by implication, unnecessary red tape. You know, people are, are now kind of realising the value and, and the sort of, you know, importance of, uh, of clean beaches and uh, proper arrangements for disposing of animal carcasses and, and, you know, all the rest of this very sort of bread and butter stuff that's, that's there and all this will have to be, have to be worked through. Okay. Um, I'll try and be brief. The, the, these are three fascinating questions. On immigration, um, two things that I just want to note. The first is that um, government policy towards immigration is very different in Scotland. Scotland is a, a country that needs its population to grow. Um, and it, it's been a feature of the debate since the referendum um, that our First Minister has wanted to um, extend uh, a reassurance and a welcome to the people who are not UK citizens living in Scotland that they are welcome and that their contribution is valued. And the implication of that is that um, Scotland would, would want to uh, welcome uh, immigration in future. And that's obviously very different from the tone of public debate south of the border. Um, second point on, on that is about borders. Uh, I was in Dublin earlier this week and um, many of the border issues that we were thinking about in, in 2014, of course, may arise in the island of Ireland. Um, and I think it's going to be quite important to um, stay in touch in that wider circle of intergovernmental relations, for example, through the British Irish Council, which um, is, is a good forum for these things. Um, I won't say how I think it could work because I don't know, but uh, I think it's clearly going to be a major issue. And on how do we get out of all of this mess? Well, um, th there's a whole other seminar in that. In fact, that's probably a 10-year <laughs> a, a research programme. Um, but what, one point I would make back to you is that um, if, uh, I've been dealing with the Constitution for quite a long time now, and um, over that time I've come to think that it's been a problem for the UK government, or any UK government, 
that it thinks of its relationship with um, the territories in a separate box from the way that it thinks about other aspects of the constitution, the House of Lords, the voting system, and so on. And that is changing. You know, that, that, that those things are now together in the UK governance group in the Cabinet Office. And if, if life was quiet and there was the time for quiet, calm deliberation, as Gilbert and Sullivan said, then perhaps that would allow us to work through these things and, and design a perfect constitution. But life isn't like that. Right. Okay. Okay, sure. Um, so, yes, I'm definitely not going to be able to answer those questions either. I mean, immigration, yes, certainly is going to be one of the big issues. I, 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 I talked about it a bit. I mean, as far as... Um, as far as the island of Ireland is, is, is concerned, I mean, we, we were talking about possible deals that allow bits of the country to have, you know, differential access to, to the single market or whatever. I mean, I would have thought if there's one bit that, you know, there's one specific deal that probably all parts of the UK would favour doing, it would be somehow to maintain the common travel area, um, even if you know, there are um, uh, controls put on freedom of movement from elsewhere in the EU um, into the UK. I mean, that's, that's speculative, but, you know, given the sensitivity of those issues and the f continuing fragi fragility of devolution and power sharing in Northern Ireland, I would have thought that, you know, that would be something people would, would put serious thought into. How we, can, how we can ensure that. And indeed, I mean, it's not just the UK and Irish governments. The EU institutions are committed to and, you know, f provide funding for and so on, um, the cross-border initiatives between North and South as well. And, and indeed, the, 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 the Good Friday Agreement um, has reference to European institutions and sort of is predicated on both sides of the border being within the EU, or at least sort of, single market, I guess, or, or, and so on. So that's obviously a really key issue to get right. Um, don't know exactly how it will work out. Legislation, I think the others definitely have better sense of that than I, so I won't comment on that. And um, how do we fix all this mess? Yeah, I mean, <laughs> I do think, I've, I said this before, I mean, as far as the relationship between the nation, so the territorial constitution, um, I, I, I can see that we may well, you know, come out of this with something quite different, aspects of it, you know, codified in a more systematic way than has, has previously <coughs> been the case, where, as, as Ken said, there's been, and Karis too, indeed, there's been a set of sort of bilateral ad hoc deals in response to specific problems as they crop up. Um, and, you know, this is surely, if ever there has been one, a, a constitutional moment. So we don't know what's going to come out of it, but something different would be my prediction. I'm not from the moment. That's very brave. Yeah, but bold, bold predictions. <laughs> You're a lot of work for yourself. Um, I'm not sure a constitutional moment, I'd say moments. I mean, I'm, I'm struck in conclusion. I mean, one, uh, we could have at least four further um, seminars on constitutional issues, London, Northern Ireland, and England. I mean, the interesting thing, you know, Ken raised, is the uh, aspects of the English question, which will come back in various forms. I mean, um, we'll see as the new government it unrolls how much that aspect is reflected in, in that. And lots of, lots of questions, and, and I think things which have been pigeonholed or, 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 or isolated um, will come through to connect very clearly. And also, as I was saying earlier, I think the sense which had been the hope, certainly the UK government, um, up to the, the vote of, of, of um, uh, three weeks ago, that somehow things will be settled in a year or so's time, is completely the reverse. And lots and lots of complicated um, interrelationships. And as you said, it raises far more questions from, from what's happening on single market trade to intergovernmental relations. So, um, could, uh, before I ask everyone to thank you, um, uh, um, I will have the pleasure of being sitting in the audience in future rather than chairing these events. And what I'm looking forward to is seeing Ken, Karis and Akash on the platform um, uh, later this year, early next year, um, in a uh, further series of explaining what is happening. So could I ask you all to join me in thanking them? Thank you.